be six. I ask you to open the Bible to that uh, part of God's Word, page 712 in my Bible. For the director of music of the sons of Korah, according to the Alamoth, and what that uh, word exactly implies, no one is for sure. It's evidently a musical tune that was employed. It is a song to be sung. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see the works of the Lord. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. This psalm is one of the more well-known psalms and uh, probably enjoys a rank that very few of the psalms hold, like Psalm 23 and Psalm 51, for being the kind of psalm that has sustained people in difficult moments in their life. It is a tremendous psalm or song of confidence. Kittel, a commentator on the Old Testament, calls it the song of the songs of faith in the Psalter. This psalm was a great encouragement to Martin Luther and uh, became kind of the hymn battle cry of the Reformation as Luther lifted out the first words directly in a mighty fortress is our God and then proceeded to develop the rest of his song around the theological content of Psalm 46, although he departed thereafter from the words found in verse 1. The whole of uh, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, which we sang earlier this evening, uh, looks uh, to that great day when God will indeed uh, be acknowledged as victor over all. Actually, the occasion for which Luther wrote A Mighty Fortress is Our God came in shortly after 1529 when Vienna, Austria was besieged by the Turks. There was a great Muslim invasion in the early 16th century of Europe, and uh, it was uh, following the siege of Vienna, which uh, the Turks were not able to conquer, and their receding away from that prompted uh, Luther to pen the words, which, of course, still are used in the body of Christ. There's one other interesting footnote on this psalm that has brought it even into recent uh, contention as to who it might have been that helped work on the translation of the psalm from Hebrew into the King James English. And there have been, maybe you read about this, I think it was uh, in some of the papers last year, that there has been speculation that uh, no less a person than Shakespeare worked on the translation of this psalm from the Hebrew into the uh, King James Bible. And the reason for that is uh, a unique thing that happens in regard to the word employment of the Psalms in Psalm 46. It is Psalm 46. Would you believe that in the King James edition of the Bible, the 46th word from the beginning of the Psalm is the word shake. And the 46th word from the end of the Psalm in the King James Bible is the word spear. Some thought they saw in that the devious hand of Shakespeare who left his footprint on a translation in the Bible. Well, it is a v very interesting uh, coincidence, but there is no evidence at all that Shakespeare ever worked on a, on a translation of the Bible, although the King James was, I think, produced uh, somewhat contemporaneous to the time of Shakespeare. But if you're using the King James, you can always remember this as uh, Shakespeare's psalm, if you like. The psalm itself is a very robust expression of faith in God. It proclaims God's ascendancy or, or supremacy over three areas, each area coming, I think, uh, more strategically uh, wider than the previous area. First, there is God's ascendancy or power or supremacy over nature, verses 1 through 3. And then verses 4 through 7, the second part of the psalm, his ascendancy over the attackers of his city, and when we look at the city that is being referred to, it's obvious that it's Jerusalem, but the city has reference not only to the earthly city of Jerusalem, but the heavenly New Jerusalem as well. 
And then the third sphere of the psalm takes us into God's ascendancy or power or supremacy over the whole warring world from verse 8 through 11. So nature, city, and world is the movement of the psalm. It is a powerful and defiant psalm suggesting in the tenor of its language that it was composed at a time of crisis. And I found that when statements of faith are made at a time of crisis, they ultimately prove to even be more powerful. Anyone can sing when the sun's shining bright, as the gospel song says, but, it, but it's something else when you can have a song in your heart at night. And obviously this uh, psalm has been working through some very perilous times, and yet proclaiming in the midst of those uh, difficult times that uh, the Lord is sovereign and supreme. You'll notice if you've been looking at the text as I've given you the three divisions of the psalm, that at the close of each division there is that wonderful word, Selah. And I don't remember, I think we did earlier, a year or so ago, when we were just getting into the psalms, I talked about the possible meaning of the word Selah. Let me just cover again the possibilities of what is involved with Selah, because I think if we can appreciate that fact, the psalms become even more meaningful to us as we read them or use them in corporate worship. There are three possibilities as to what Selah means, and all of them may have been employed at one time or another, so it's not a case of option one being more correct than option three. It's simply that uh, any one of these three could uh, very well be have been in the mind of uh, either the psalmist when he wrote the psalm or been employed by people who used the psalm when it was being sung. The first idea associated with Selah is that it indicated a musical direction uh, to uh, either the singers or the orchestra to, quote, lift up. That's the root idea of Selah, to lift up. And therefore, if it were being sung by a choir or by a soloist or being accompanied by an orchestra, this was the time to, so to speak, pull out all the stops and really bang the drum and uh, wake people up out of their seats and and just do the crescendo. I think in music today we call this forte, don't we? Do we have a do we have a, an adjective even in front of forte that makes it even more grand? Huh? Mezzo forte. All right, this is a mezzo forte for Sila. Uh, another possibility is that uh, it is a, a liturgical mark, again meaning to lift up, which suggests to the person who is using it in the psalm, that at this particular moment they need to lift up their voice or lift up their hand or do something vocally or physically demonstrative to underline the message and content of that particular moment. It may have uh, uh, been used, uh, for example, in this psalm in the times of the exile uh, when Israel was in captivity by a priest to underscore at uh, some particular moment the need for a Tremendous response from the congregation, like a wave of hallelujah, or a wave of amens, or a chorus of praise that sweeps across a body of believers as they recite together the praise that is being given to God. Some have suggested that uh, to lift up has to do with lifting up the eyes for the purpose of repeating the verse. Uh, others have even suggested that uh, to lift up could also mean in an Aramaic root to bow, or that at this point in the service the worshiper, rather than simply lifting up his eyes or lifting up his hands, may even find it appropriate to fall prostrate before God. Or, But the idea is to do some demonstrative act which underscores the, the particular uh, nuance of expression that is being given in worship. So... It can be a musical direction to the singers or orchestra. It can be a direction to those who are worshiping. And uh, a third possibility, and there are um, a couple of, uh, I can get into technical terms here, but there is a Targum, which is a commentary on the Old Testament in Hebrew, a Targum called Aquila and the Vulgate, which is a Latin translation of the Bible, which renders Sela by phrases implying an outburst of something akin to Amen, Hallelujah. Again, we have um, kind of a response springing directly out of the congregation that says, we're participating in this. This is not scripture just being read um, so that when we see Selah, what we ought to be saying is, uh, it's time to stop. Think about this. Praise the Lord for this. Lift up your hands. Lift up your voice. Lift up your heart. So let's take a moment as we go through this psalm. When I come to Selah, we'll just all say it real loudly together. When we got to get down with each section, I promise not to preach an everlasting message tonight on each section. Let's look at the the breakdown of this psalm. First, verses 1 through 3, 
might be headlined, God in the tumult. God in the tumult. The tumult obviously here has to do with nature, and it speaks of a time of uh, trouble. Uh, and ever-present help in trouble is used. Uh, the times of trouble in these three verses from uh, the viewpoint of creation, and, and indeed this psalm is written off what is called a creation motif. That is, the psalmist is consciously going back to that time when God created order out of the chaos. That We know that before God formed the land and divided it from the waters, that the earth was formless and void, and that he brought creation out of chaos. But, and what is trouble? Trouble is a reimposition of the chaos upon the creation. And, and uh, that is what is happening here. There, there are two fundamental things that are happening in creation in these three verses. One is earthquake, and the other is tidal wave. If you've ever been in a good either one of those, those are tremendously frightening times when all of order and the skyscrapers of man and um, the beachfront houses of the posh and the wealthy and everybody is just all up for grabs, the reemergence of the chaos. And uh, that is, that is uh, that figure of nature, the chaos imposing itself upon the structured order that God has created, is meant to uh, re-imply for us that this is what trouble in life always is. Trouble plunges us into chaos. And uh, we can uh, uh, see that, of course, that chaos occurs when the structure of our life is suddenly threatened. And what seems to be so secure is no longer secure. From the psalmist's point of view, verses 1 through 3, nothing seems to be more secure than the earth in which we're standing on. And the sea, confined within its limits, seems to be so secure. I mean, we can go out there day after day, and we know how high the tide comes and how low it comes, and it seems to be within its bounds. Therefore, when the earth is rolling and when the sea is moving up in points that, paths that were not appointed to it, uh, we see uh, this uh, tremendous sense of all that is stable being threatened, and that is symptomatic of the struggles of life. And I was thinking how uh, our earthly security needs, uh, we don't really give a lot of thought to them until they begin getting um, impinged upon by the chaos. Uh, for example, like food and shelter, uh, we take those for granted until our sources of uh, finance become cut off, and relationships and family, you know, there's probably no more difficult emotional order to deal with than uh, difficulties within relationships and within family, and that that's why Psalm 46 is such a helpful psalm when we're going through a period of relational difficulty, because it's as though the earth is moving underneath our feet. A uh, health, bad health can be that. You know, we take our health so easily for granted, but when that begins to slide away from us, again, it is the chaos emerging into this beautifully structured body that God has made, and our finances, or whatever it is. You know, chaos can be, uh, can be the cessation of meaningful activity in our life. We were moving along and doing something meaningful, and then that opportunity was taken from us, and we have to get uh, re-geared. This psalm is telling us that in a time when everything is shaking, we may find, we may find that the only security we can count on is God. Uh, who is going to help when the earth is moving and when the sea is moving in? Man's help is no longer available. And, of course, it is, it is the case that uh, being human, all of us are. We probably turn to other people to help us. But the more deep our, our needs are, the more deep our problems are, the, the more we have to find as uh, believers in the Lord that there are some things that only God can help us with, that they're beyond, really beyond human solution. I think I see that more every day of my life. I, I must tell you, I've not always been there as a Christian, and I, I've had this indomitable. If you know, if it's broken, it can be fixed. There's no solution that can't be fixed, uh, or no problem that the solution can't fix it. And you realize, as you come across the words of the psalm, there are some situations that human ingenuity and human will and human purpose and human resources simply can't address, and that in those kinds of times, if we don't find our help in God, we're we're really. Uh, in this world without hope and without help. But conversely, the psalmist is saying, in that time of shaking, we can find God. God offers His presence to us when the chaos attempts to reassert its supremacy over the order of creation. 
God is our refuge and strength, ever-present help, meaning not just available to help us sometimes, but he is ever-present in that time when the earth is moving under our feet and the waters are engulfing us. Probably if I had a if I had a great physical fear, I'm not as afraid of earthquakes as I am afraid of drowning. In fact, I guess that you've been, I've, been in a, I've never been in a major earthquake, so maybe I'd really get afraid of earthquakes if I really was in one where the buildings were falling down. Have any of you ever been in a building where the build, I mean, an earthquake where the buildings were falling down on you, around you? Are you afraid of earthquakes now? Probably are. Ray, are you? Virginia? You, you're, you, you're not afraid of anything. But uh, I, I just, you know, I've been in six-point earthquakes from a distance, but I mean, but boy, I almost drowned when I was a kid, and don't, you know, get me in a position where I'm vulnerable to water. That just panics me. And um, the, But the psalmist is saying in those kinds of times, we'll find God our refuge and strength. Refuge and strength, by the way, brings to us a reminder of two aspects of God's care for us when we are going through times of trouble. Refuge speaks of the defensive or external aspect of his salvation, that we can find in him one in whom we can hide, one in whom we can place our security in such a time. But the word strength, God is our strength, refers to the dynamic aspect, the positive aspect, the internal aspect, that God is within us. In other words, God is, God is that one in whom we can escape and find security in our times of trouble, but he also is one who energizes us in our times of trouble, gives us not only a fleeing place, but gives us a sustaining place, empowers us on the inside to walk through it. And uh, so, therefore, the, the twin aspects of facing trouble as a Christian are reflected in those two words. Because what is one of the things that we want to do in trouble? We want to get away, don't we? We want just say, I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. Or as in another place, the psalmist has said, oh, that I had the wings of the morning. Or oh, the wings of a dove and could, what's the rest of that psalm, Ray? Oh, that I had the wings of a dove and could fly. Where to? Far away is the morning or whatever. I'm butchering the quote, but you know what I mean. And people, you know, we, we, when we get in trouble and then that begins to happen to us, it's easy to begin to feel guilty because we have an escapist complex. But isn't an escapist complex sometimes necessary for the sustenance of life itself? There's nothing wrong with escapism as long as you balance it with the other factor that it's not just escapism, it is also the strengthening power of the Lord to walk through it. We need both dimensions. And sometimes we'll be, at any given moment, more on the side of refuge or more on the side of being strengthened, depending, maybe sometimes even on the hour of day that we're at. But uh, the psalmist here, the sons of Korah, who wrote this psalm, under the inspiration of the Spirit, are saying, God is, that, is both of those things to us. Selah. Selah. Amen. All right. He is that. So we go from the theme of um, God in the tumult of our life to God in his city, verses 4 through 7. Uh, the writer of this psalm turns now from the upheaval in nature, which is traced in verses 1 through 3, to the uh, totally different imagery of a city in under siege. Has anyone here ever lived in a city that was under siege, a walled city under siege? No one of us have. I've lived in a walled city. You've lived in a walled city under siege? In the middle of Vietnam. Well, so you, you can identify with this. Barbed wire in the middle of Vietnam. I think that would be classified as a city under siege that's walled. That is a scary prospect. And um, I can remember as a kid... I don't have a very dim. I don't have a very strong memory of this, but I know that uh, the city wall was a place of security. You felt secure inside, and uh, also there were occasions when the heads of executed criminals were hung on the si over the city wall at the city gate to let people know that they meant business in that town about law and order. So, here's a picture of a of a of a city against whom the nations are in uproar, which carries the idea of siege. But as you look within this city, you find a city at peace. It's as though in reading verses 4 through 7, God has already dealt with the enemies of the city. And I've already suggested 
that the city is both a representation of earthly Jerusalem that at some point when this psalm was composed had probably been through a time of siege, but it is representative of the city of God, that great phrase that Augustine gave us in his uh, book, The City of God, written in the 4th century, in which he talks about the city of God among men, but uh, Revelation carries that one step further and says that there is a city in heaven that is modeled after the earthly city in which God's throne is made righteous and secure, and even though the nations gather around about it, it is secure. And in that city there are waters of life. And notice the difference in water between verses 1 through 3 and verses 4 through 6. In verses 1 through 3, it's the water that is the source of chaos. But in the city of God, the waters are not a menacing sea, but a life-giving river, which is God's way of saying that he makes nature serve him. It is in the turbulent world that we experience the overwhelming threat of flood. But in the security within God's place, uh, to which we repair, the refuge to which we repair, we find that the most menacing elements of creation are subdued and produce instead not only beautiful beauty, there's nothing more beautiful than a river or a life or life giving fountains, but also produce nourishment and refreshment. Uh, the mountains also may fall in verse two, but in this city, uh, this city she will not fall. And the word, by the way, for fall in verse 2, the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. And uh, the word for fall in verse 5, she will not fall, is the same word in the Hebrew language as it is in the English, signifying again that God has given to his people security. His help, the psalmist said, is at the break of day. God will help her at the break of day. One here can only be reminded of the tremendous invasion of Sennacherib, king of Assyria, when he had surrounded Jerusalem in the days of Hezekiah, some think this psalm was written during the days of Hezekiah when, according to Sennacherib's own records, he, quote, shut Hezekiah up like a bird in a cage, close quote. That is not a, a reference found in the Scripture, but in the annals of, uh, of uh, Assyria, uh, Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, an archaeological work that was done there a number of decades ago, that quote from Sennacherib was found in reference to his siege of Jerusalem, which he suddenly lifted. There were, uh, what, 600,000 casualties that the angel of the Lord caused to the Assyrian army on that occasion, which left Jerusalem secure as a city. And, they, uh, and the city, of course, was made aware of the great victory that had been accomplished at the break of day. So the reference to break of day could be that particular victory, or it may point backward in time to the fact that uh, in the uh, in the in the Exodus from Egypt, uh, Exodus chapter 14, verse 27, when the children of Israel had come out of Egypt again, they were in a in a time when the chaos threatened to engulf them. The waters of the Red Sea were part of the waters that turbulent uh, thing which needs to be tamed by the hand of God, ready to engulf them. But God created a way through the sea. And at daybreak, Moses stretched out his hand back over the sea, and the armies of Egypt were drowned in the sea. God's greatest victory in the Old Testament occurred at daybreak. And God's greatest victory in the New Testament also occurred at daybreak. It was very early in the morning Jesus rose again from the dead. Mark chapter 16, verse 9 states that. So uh, God is our help early in the morning. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall, he lifts his voice, and the earth melts. Um, the judgment that occurs here, uh, well, let's see, I'll get to that judgment in just, just a moment. That's coming up in a later verse. This uh, fact that, uh, oh, no, I think it is in verse 6. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall, he lifts his voice, the earth melts. It's interesting that that little verse suggests that God's judgment in human relations works two ways. There is, first of all, an inherent instability in evil and in wrong, so that nations fall. Why is it that we have, you know, nation after nation that comes on the world scene and then collapses? Is it because God imposes a direct judgment? Most cases, not. He simply lets them fall of their own weight, and there is a kind of an ascendancy that a kingdom or an empire goes through, and then it collapses. So nations fall. God can work his judgment through just the normal laws of sowing and reaping. But also, God works his judgment in a direct way, as here, when his voice is decisive in dissolving the world of man. This uh, section of God is within his city is concluded by an affirmation. 
God is both the Lord Almighty and the God of Jacob. And those are two contrasting phrases when related to God, because Lord Almighty suggests to us his powerful sovereignty, but God of Jacob suggests to us a God whose victory we know when we've really wrestled with him and struggled with him. He is the God of the struggler. And if any person was ever ever epitomized to us struggle in life, it had to be Jacob. And it's encouraging to me to find continually in the Old Testament that great phrase being used of God, that he is the God of Jacob. And I think that's especially a reference that can be used for all of us who go through struggle in life and have to contend with things that are bigger than us and at times even um, wrestle with God over matters. God is our fortress, the God who is the God of Jacob. Fortress here is a different word than the word refuge in verse 1. Fortress in the Hebrew implies an inaccessible height. So we find in God not only the security of being in his city, but we are lifted up in such a place of protection that nothing can assail us or reach us there. God in his city. Selah. Think about that. Selah. And then God exalted in the earth, verses 8 through 11. We have an invitation here into the future where the psalmist, uh, so to speak, goes eschatological. That is, he jumps into the future. Now, not just the present, but he invites us on the basis of a victory that has just been won in Israel to look at that as a tip-off to all that God is going to do in that day. Come and see the works of the Lord, the desolations he has brought on the world. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. It's interesting how God brings peace here. Uh, He brings peace through conflict. It is through war that God imposes his peace upon a rebellious humanity. And uh, for those who in this world who think of Jesus as something, someone who is only gentle and mild and kind and is going to win the world uh, to his cause alone through gentility, there is the book of Revelation reminding us, especially Revelation 19, of a Lord who returns in triumph and shatters the armies of this world. And peace is not always won through gentleness, as much as that is always God's first effort and should be ours as well. Peace sometimes comes at the price of horrendous conflict. And the peace that is the world is at today among its, uh, among its nations in terms of the fact there is no current world war was won at the price of the horrible conflicts of World War I and World War II. And that is being played out here. And I might also add that what the Scriptures indicate about peace being won through conflict may sometimes also be the case in uh, difficult uh, personal situations that we find ourselves in where we're wanting a resolution on a matter, whether it's a financial matter or or if, if it's a health matter, for example. Sometimes the way to peace in the body is to fall in under the surgeon's knife. And sometimes the way to peace in a relationship is to no longer duck an issue but face it head on and be prepared for the aftermath and the conflict that will occur because a person is no longer ducking the issue but finally is facing it. And uh, here is a, an, an, an area where God says ultimately he is going to face down conflict against him and he's not going to deal with it gently, but he will accomplish his peace because when he is done burning the shields and shattering the bow and the spear... He invites us then to be still and know that I am God. Here in the psalm, God is now speaking directly. It's no longer the psalmist speaking. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. I wouldn't be surprised at all that Jesus had this psalm in mind when he was at the Lake of Galilee. Because I think if you look at Mark chapter 435 through the end of that chapter, you will see all of the elements of this psalm present in that experience of Jesus being in that boat on the Lake of Galilee. The primordial chaos of waters gone wild, threatening the structured order of creation and the structured lives of the disciples. Suddenly everything is out of control And nature, adversity, is raging. And in the middle of that context, Jesus stands up and recites really the words that occur here in Psalm 46.10. Be still. Be still and know that I am God. I will 
be exalted in the earth, I will be exalted among the nations. And it's good, again, to know that God does bring us that peace in the midst of storm and peace in the midst of conflict. With renewed confidence, uh, the psalmist goes back to speaking again the words of verse 7, a repeat, a reminder that the Lord Almighty and the God of the struggler is our fortress. Selah. 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 Amen. God in the tumult. God in the city. God triumphing in the earth. God over the nations and exalted in the earth. Psalm 46, a great psalm of encouragement to remind us that in a time of trouble when we don't have anyone who can help us, God is there. Our Lord, we come to you tonight refreshed with the words of this psalm. You are our refuge and our strength. How we need that two-sided dimensionality of your person tonight in our lives. Some of us are here this evening and we need a moment of escape and a moment of respite from uh, our struggle and our problems. And it's so good to come into an atmosphere of your presence where there is such peace and such tranquility and such confidence and we feel safe. Think of analogies like a frightened child that finds security on a mother's lap. And we often feel that way in your presence, Lord. When that around us is intimidating and unpredictable and dangerous psychologically or physically or financially, we can come to you and we can find a secure place in you. There is a hiding place, a strong protective place where God provides the grace to persevere. Thank you, Lord, that we can enter into that in you. And thank you, Lord, also that it is in the place of refuge that you give us the dynamic aspect of your indwelling in our life, that you also strengthen us to go out and emerge from that uh, cocoon-like shelter of your presence, to face with our feet on shaking ground the disturbed elements of our personal world and find that in that strengthening you are present. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be moved, and though the mountains even be cast into the sea. Who of us would not be afraid if this very evening we stood on the plateau land of Costa Mesa and watched as the mountains of San Bernardino were lifted up and thrown with great might into the Pacific? Who of us would not fear at such a sight. But here in your word, we find that even in such a cataclysmic moment as that, you're saying to us, we have a place of refuge and a place of strength. That when our world is shaken, you're not shaken. When everything that can be moved is being moved, you're not moved. Your world is secure. Your city is secure. Your victory and consummation of victory in the age to come, that is secure. There is nothing about you that is insecure. Our future may be insecure. But you, in you, we have our security. You are our refuge and our strength. Thank you, Lord, for being that to us tonight. Thank you for your strengthening presence. We praise you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord.